Hello, sisters. Welcome to the Sacred Medicine Podcast, weaving powerful, soulful practices into functional medicine. Step into this beautiful space of devotion and explore everything from nurturing foods, rituals, sexuality, and awakening your innate sensuality. It is time to own your radiance. This is the Sacred Medicine Podcast. And we are back for another week of the Sacred Medicine Podcast. Thank you so much for joining. I am your host, Margaret Romero. And if you're joining for the first time, welcome. Thank you so much. And for all of my devoted listeners, big hugs to you for joining me for another week. So this week I have Madeline McKinnon. She is a health coach and founder of Natural Hormone Healing. And this week we are talking about food and your health. So we dive into adrenal fatigue and what foods to eat and what foods to avoid. Also about foods that actually enhance fertility for women, which that's pretty cool. And we also talk about foods um, around your menstrual cycle. So there are four different phases throughout your menstrual cycle and ones that we need to actually focus on and also what to do with some PMS symptoms and how to alleviate those naturally and some of the downsides to the birth control pill. A lot of you may be on birth control. So we talk about some of the things that I actually commonly see in my practice one of them being very low to zero libido after many years of being on the pill. So we talk about how to uh, handle some of these downsides of the birth control. So I hope you are ready for a really fantastic interview with Madeline and on to the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Sacred Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Margaret Romero, and this week we have Madeline McKinnon. She is a nutrition consultant, health coach, and founder of Natural Hormone Healing. Thank you so much for joining me today, Madeline. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So I went on your website. I loved all the things that you do because it's a lot also of what I do in my practice. And I'd love your take on, there's just so many really cool topics for women here on adrenal Mm -hmm. health, um, foods to help enhance fertility, and even different foods um, for different phases of your cycle, of your menstrual cycle. And I'd love to be able to just dive into, we can just, let's start at, um, Let's start at adrenal health because that is actually a really huge topic in my practice and it's something that I see so frequently and Mm -hmm. I'd love your take. I love your take on it on like what you do, how do women know if they're having any kind of adrenal fatigue and what you do to kind of help them get out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, adrenal fatigue is so common. I'm just shocked every single year, it seems like more and more people are resonating with that. And adrenal fatigue is something quite personal for me, because I definitely experienced some pretty, well, pretty extreme adrenal and thyroid issues um, a few years ago. And adrenal fatigue is interesting, because it can happen when it can be really hard to like heal it sometimes for a lot of different women and sometimes hard to under like really know that you're in it, like until you actually like realize after a while that you have it. Um, so my experience was I was just under putting myself under a lot of stress and all of a sudden I just got this extreme anxiety, heart, heart beating really fast at night, having trouble sleeping, feeling definitely drained and not like myself. And this was really tough because I was really focused on my health. I was already working as a nutritionist and I've been in the health field forever. And it felt like really powerless to heal it. And then I finally figured some stuff out and realized that 
what, what was really causing my stress and found some ways to really get that under control and balanced. And that's been such a huge, um, topics, um, in my practice as well. So I'd love to share. Um, I have a lot of, a lot of stuff that we could talk about related to adrenal fatigue, but yeah, definitely would love to share this with your listeners. Yeah. You know, I also have a personal, um, history with adrenal fatigue. Definitely. It, um, if I don't, I'm not sure if you know my whole story, but um, over 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with lupus nephritis and mm-hmm. being on so much prednisone at the time to get me out of like a crisis flare. Um, and I was in the hospital and all that stuff um, that completely <laughs> my adrenals were shot. So mm-hmm. I had to really rebuild them. And it, I have to be honest with you, it's not an overnight thing. Um, it takes a while to rebuild them. And yeah, so I'd love your take on, you know, you've had experience with it. I've had experience with it. There's definitely certain foods that I eat that I don't eat, things that I do mm-hmm. and I don't do. And even now, if I'm really stressed or um, I'm really careful with not overdoing anything and then leaning on, you know, caffeine and too much chocolate and, and just things that can sometimes be, be a little depleting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think with adrenal fatigue, um, it can just be yeah, such a challenge to understand that you're in it for a lot of women. And then it also with adrenal fatigue, it's important to understand like what's causing it and also really getting into the symptoms because I, you might have read some of the articles on my website and there's actually three different stages of adrenal fatigue. So there is stage one adrenal fatigue where you, it's when your cortisol levels are elevated because adrenal fatigue is essentially like a, a dysregulation of your cortisol, which is your stress hormone. And your cortisol is supposed to be high. Um, at a, it, it really needs more of a Goldilocks Goldilocks balance between it, but it's usually high in the morning and then it kind of goes lower during the day. And at the end of the day, it will drop. So then that helps you sleep. Um, Mm -hmm. There's three different types of adrenal fatigue. There's stage one where your cortisol is elevated throughout the entire day. And this is a, this is usually what you'll start to feel first if you're going through adrenal fatigue and it definitely can be triggered by any type of stress. So even going through a disease and treatment um, can be enough to cause adrenal fatigue, even if it's not the act. um, It's usually for a lot of women, it's just stress, extreme everyday stress, but it can be a lot of different forms of stress can trigger that. Um, But usually like the the stage one will be where you kind of have the energy, but you're feeling still like you're almost, you're running off of adrenaline and you're kind of burning out a bit. You might get the weight gain and have trouble sleeping. And then stage two is more when it kind of flips. So then you get low cortisol in the morning. So it's hard to get out of bed and just like have to drag yourself through the day. And then all of a sudden your cortisol uh, and in the evening will go up. So you get this like second or third or fourth wind, depending on how many you, how many you experience, but mm-hmm. that will be something where I, I'm sure a lot of women listening can relate where you feel wired, but tired. So you might've just been feeling kind of mentally foggy throughout the day. And then all of a sudden you just kind of perk up and then you can do everything, but then it's hard to wind down and sleep. Uh, so that's stage two. And you can of course get all the, the energy, like belly fat, brain fog, um, anxiety sometimes too. And then stage three is where it can get more, um, more of an intense problem where it can, it's very serious for a lot of women where you can get this low cortisol throughout the entire, um, day. And sometimes it's hard to get out of bed and just do anything. You'll have brain fog. And also you can get symptoms of autoimmune conditions, Um, it can, because it can impact your immune system. So you can get more achy joints and allergies. Uh, and this is when it's like, if you're feeling this, you really want to get very serious. This is like something where it it really needs to take that commitment to heal. And it, it can take between six to 12 months, sometimes more of really working on it. Mm hmm. So true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So that's, that's the important thing to like, kind of understand where you are and you can take, you can learn a lot from your symptomology, but however, like corti- you can take a cortisol test, a saliva test to, to get it done throughout the day to really tell for sure what's, what's going on. Uh, but this is something too, it's important that women know about because there's a lot of supplements and treatments out there that will end up treating like two stages at once. So they'll, the, in a supplement, they might give you something for um, high cortisol and then something for low cortisol altogether because it's like an adrenal supplement. But then it's all counterintuitive to where you're at. So that's something that pretty I'm really passionate about, like telling people because you know it's already it's already takes such a commitment to just like heal the adrenals, and you don't want to be able to be getting like counter into getting uh, results that aren't gonna actually help you totally totally Mm -hmm. all right so let's say we've got someone who is oh well let's say we have you know we have people in all different stages here are you Mm -hmm. what is your approach is your approach um dietary strictly nutritional um that's part of my approach my approach is definitely stress management and teaching teaching people how to get control of their nervous system and get control of their stress response. Cause this really helped me when I think I was just putting myself under a lot of internal stress at that time. And I was getting into the fight or flight response where you're going into your, um, sympathetic nervous system, which is your stress response. And I think it's so important uh, for women to learn tools to flip out and make sure that you're not functioning in that state, because it can be really hard to heal when you're when your nervous system is operating like that, because there's only a short amount of time that anyone can handle that. We're not evolve to be able to handle that for a long period of time. So I'm really passionate about teaching like some just stress management tools. And it's going to be different for any woman. But I really love like anything to do with breathing because our our breath controls our nervous system. So it the holistic kind of focusing on whatever is going to get you out of that stress response is something that I'll work with on with a client. And it, it can really depend on like what it is for them. So it might for them, it might be yoga, it might be getting a massage, it might just be like relaxing and reading a book. It can be whatever it is. I just want to help them get out of that stress response. So that's a huge thing, like breathing and nutrition for sure. I focus a lot on nutrition, um, especially around balancing the blood sugar as well, because um, making sure you're getting that stable blood sugar can really help support the adrenals. There's, of course, a lot of other foods to talk about. And then And then based on someone's level of adrenal fatigue, we'll also do certain herbs, certain supplements, and certain protocols that are just customized to where they are. Okay, love it. Love it. And I did see that you had such a delicious looking casserole Mm -hmm. on your website that looked phenomenal. So tell us why this casserole, tell us some of the ingredients in it and why it's so important for adrenal health. Mm -hmm. First thing, yeah, whenever I make recipes for women with adrenal fatigue, I want to make sure that they're easy and really simple with as minimal ingredients as possible because usually with adrenal fatigue and any sort of forms of hormone imbalances for women – then doing any small things or just do, just making a dinner can seem very daunting because of the brain fog and what's going on. So I always love to have easy things. So this is a casserole that you can make, make up just once a week and then you could have it for your breakfast or lunch or dinner like any time of day. Uh, so with that, um, that's an r- example of a blood sugar balancing meal. So we have a sweet potato crust. So we're doing sweet potatoes on the bottom. That's giving your body a little bit of really good complex carbs. So it's I'm, when I say blood sugar balance, it's not about low carbs. It's actually you want a moderate amount of carbs because that's going to help you really stabilize your blood sugar without putting stress on your body. Because low going really low carb for some women with adrenal fatigue can actually put extra stress on the system. And I don't want any more stress. Mm -hmm. We have eggs, which is going to give a great protein source, give some B vitamins, um, mushrooms, and 
some greens, of course, because I always love to do some greens in every meal. And optional, you can also put bacon on top if you want to. But that's optional. It just depends how much you love bacon. <laughs> no, that looks really good with the bacon on there. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. And it's a really simple, like straightforward um, recipe that I find it's just really nice and easy to follow and really great. And lots of mushrooms in there too. Yeah, 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 for sure. All right, so <clears throat> you you really want to be able to balance out with complex carbs. What else um, for adrenal fatigue? Like what if someone's revving on too high? Let's say they're stage one, they're really revving high cortisol throughout the day. I know you talked about stress reduction. Are there any foods to help with bringing down, you know, this type of adrenal issue when you have high cortisol? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in that sense, I I love using, well, tonic herbs. They're not necessarily a food. However, um, tonic and adaptogenic herbs, what they are is they're kind of different than medicinal herbs. So they're herbs that I consider to almost be like a food because they've been used in different systems of medicine, China, Ayurveda for thousands of years, and they've time tested them to make sure that they are like non-toxic. And they, when you have these, something, for example, like holy basil, so doing holy basil tea, what that's going to do, if you just drink that, is it helps your body, it, you can go through stress, but it's actually going to help your body not feel the effects of the stress as much mm -hmm. um, as you would if you didn't have it. So it's just so simple. Um, even, you know, you can do loose leaf tea, but if someone's at work, you can just get a tea bag of holy basil tea and just sip that through the day. And that will help your body not react to the stress as much. Um, other herbs that I like, um, reishi mushroom is a really good one. Um, shizandra berry, um, is great too. I love using shizandra berry. Um, um, ashwagandha is also really good, like really good one, but and there's another one that you can get um, by Ron Tea Garden. It's a, a tea called Spring Dragon Tea, and it's a specific herb called Gynostemma. And you can buy the tea bags. And this is from Dragon Herbs, which is you can get it like probably anywhere online in the U.S. And it's an excellent tea to drink to just help modulate modulate the stress response as well. Nice. All mm -hmm. right. Well, I love that. Now, I do want to switch over to foods that enhance fertility. I think this is really important. Yes. I have a lot of, a um, couple of girlfriends who, and patients who are, you know, in their maybe mid to late thirties, even forties, who are either trying naturally or trying out IVF in vitro fertilization. So I would love to be able to share with them some foods that would actually help or, you know, promote fertility? And when do women need to be consuming these foods as well? Mm -hmm, definitely. Well, a really exciting thing is that our hormones are really supported and even built off of certain nutrients. So when you have, when you add certain nutrients in your diet and have certain foods, it can really help you have optimal levels of specific hormones like progesterone, for example, which is such an important hormone for conception. And as women get older, um, after 35, progesterone levels start to decline and they're lower. And that can be one of the things that can be why it can sometimes be harder to conceive. So I always love to do foods that build progesterone and I'll definitely and talk about some really good ideas as well. Um, and another thing that I love to do is, is time foods to different phases in your cycle too, because a, a woman's menstrual cycle has different phases with different hormone levels. So we go, when you're on your period, your estrogen and your progesterone is low, and then the estrogen starts to go up. That's helps spur the ovulation, testosterone goes up. And then after ovulation, progesterone takes over and then progesterone is really high. So for women wanting to conceive, you can try and help optimize those hormones so they can be at their perfect level. Um, so some examples of this is during ovulation, your estrogen levels are really high and your body needs to be able to eliminate that estrogen successfully from the body because, and we do this usually through our bowels, through our, our liver is a lot at play. We need to break down that estrogen 
And we got to get that out um, because if it doesn't go out properly, it can reabsorb and then it can affect the progesterone, which is so important for conception and, and maintaining a pregnancy later on. So during ovulation, what you can do is have foods that actually can help you eliminate the estrogen out of your body. So an example that could be really simple is having some th- some brassicas, so lots of like raw brass. Um, raw like veggies. So it it doesn't have to be brassicas, but even raw carrots have been shown through research. Eating a raw carrot a day can help with detoxing the estrogen and um, lots of things that support the liver like beets, dandelion, and then doing like cabbage and more raw like fibrous foods Mm -hmm. is what a woman can do during ovulation. But we also really need healthy fats. Like healthy fats are so essential for building the hormones. Another, an amazing fertility food is avocado. And there also has been a study done that showed that when women were going through IVF, when they had an avocado a day, they had more of a likely chance of conceiving. So you can do this stuff with an IVF treatment or if you're just naturally trying to conceive. Uh, So you could do that, like lots of healthy fats and even having some really good forms of like saturated fats like ghee and butter, like grass fed butter, egg yolks, all of those are actually really good for helping build all the sex hormones for women because our sex hormones are actually built off of cholesterol. That's the building block. And then that converts into different hormones, which eventually become your testosterone, progesterone. Um, so I really love to utilize those. Um, yeah, lots of information for your your. I love it. Actually. No, I love yeah. it. I'm really um, into and then, food. And so this is great. Yeah. This is great. So important. Yeah. And then as we get into the next phase, so after you ovulate, you go into a phase called your luteal phase. And this is your progesterone dominant phase. And if you get if women get a lot of PMS symptoms like sore breasts, like moodiness, it it can actually be a sign that there might be too high of an estrogen Mm -hmm. or the progesterone is a bit too low. So you can also use some foods to help build your progesterone and optimize. So for a woman who's trying to conceive, this is a time for to just focus even more because you might conceive during ovulation, but then you'll need that progesterone to kind of tide you over until you're usually the placenta will eventually take over. So using foods to build progesterone is great. So some a, a, one nutrient is vitamin B6. Um, which is like really, you can get that from radishes, from sunflower seeds, sesame seeds. Um, Turkey is a really great protein and lots of fish. So salmon and cod have really good forms of B6. But B6 has been another one that has been also shown in research to really eliminate PMS symptoms because of how effective it is for that progesterone production. Um, Lots of leafy greens, too, is very important. Um, So I designed a protocol um, for women that you use different foods during the cycle to help balance hormones. I'm calling I called it eating for your cycle. And it's just you can use specific targeted recipes and you can get really deep into it if you're if anyone's struggling with a hormone imbalance to do with the menstrual cycle or fertility. It can be very effective. Mm. All right. Okay, so that was so. Say those again. Sesame seeds. You have. I have yeah. salmon. Yeah. Sunflower fish. seeds. Sunflower. Uh huh. Yeah, tuna is good, but I'm kind of iffy about tuna because of the heavy metals. But it is actually really high in a lot of these <laughs> hormone balancing nutrients. Um, yes, cod. Um, actually, avocado does. Avocado has all the fertility and hormone balancing nutrients. Avocado is definitely such a superfood. It has lots of folate too. That's important for conception. Um, so yeah, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, radishes, and then like proteins like turkey and cod and salmon. Okay, great. All right, now. What about um, foods? 
Okay, we're t- you were kind of talking a little bit about the different phases, and I know this was just mm-hmm. about fertility, but maybe take us through the different phases and like a couple of things to kind of focus on when you're, you know, all the throughout the phases of the menstrual cycle. I think that would be good. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the the interesting thing is that when we're cycling, um, we go through these four distinctive phases, and in each phase your hormone levels are really different. And the hormone levels have a big impact on our neurochemistry, our energy, our sex drive. And there's been some interesting research on how women are at different phases of the cycle um, that I'd love to share too, because you can, when you can learn more about your cycle, you can use it to optimize different areas of your life. Mm -hmm. But you can also learn how to nourish your body too, of course. But I love living when we can live more attuned to our cycle, we can feel like our hormones are working for us instead of against us. Mm Because I know a lot of women, you know, might have the experience that it's their cycle drains them and having it almost feels like a liability. But I think that when we can learn to work with it, it can start to really help us in so many ways. So yeah, I'll definitely go through all the different phases with you guys. Do you also talk about, you know, like when to not really go to the gym, when to, you know, things like that? Because I know Mm -hmm. that sometimes women, it's like they're at a time when they're just so tired and they're like, I really don't want to go to the gym and they force themselves to do it. When in your cycle, it probably would be best to not you know, Definitely. force um, such intense and rigorous exercise. So yeah, yeah. if you can include those two, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, especially the first like couple days of menstruation, the uterus has expanded in size because of the blood. Um, and that's why you might get a bit of bloating. It's totally normal because the uterus has almost doubled in size. And doing and doing heavy exercise the first couple days, um, even especially for women interested in fertility or fertility for the future, it can actually impact like your uterine position potentially. If you put strain on that area, you can put strain on the whole pelvic area. So I recommend that just gentle, especially the first couple days. And if, if you have cramps, you might not even want to do exercise, but it's just important to listen to your body to um and even before your period, too, you might want to do more gentle yoga rather than the intense bursts of exercise. Because when we, when this is kind of related to adrenal fatigue, when we really go hard during the first half of our site, during the times when we don't, it's our energy's low, it can just drain us more. So it's yeah. important to be aware of that for mm-hmm. sure. And don't feel guilty if you have low energy yeah. and don't you want guilty. rest. <laughs> so important. Yeah. 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 So the menstrual phase is, I call it the menstrual phase, but pretty much it's your period. It's the most obvious phase of the cycle to tell you're in. And usually your, your hormone levels are low. So your estrogen progesterone levels are very low. And this, and because of this, this makes your energy low and it turns your energy inward. So you might not feel as social as well. Um, and, there's some interesting things that happen too with the brain because of these hormones, you actually do become more intuitive. So your left and your right brain have really good communication during that time. So I recommend that women on a lifestyle level really take that time to set intentions for the month because it's essentially the beginning of your whole cycle. So if you can take set those intentions, look back, reflect, see what you need to change, it can be an incredible, powerful thing Mm -hmm. uh, to just really learn to live your life. Because as that energy goes up, it's kind of like riding, you're going to be riding that wave of your cycle. And then all these things in your life can just line up more. And it's yeah, it can just be such a powerful tool, um, for sure. All right. Okay, so then we go on to the next phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next phase is the follicular phase. So this phase is when your energy is starting to rise and your ovary is starting to mature a few eggs and then it ends up just picking one. And this is definitely a time where estrogen is rising, your energy is rising. Um, It's a great time to do new things. 
And if you are looking for fertility, it's a really good time to focus on really good nutrition since you're fully like maturing an egg and getting it prepared um, for ovulation. So if you can provide your body with some really good nutrition, like really anti-inflammatory foods are great. So healthy fats, like fish oil, avocado, and lots of antioxidant-rich foods too, like berries and and lots of those kind of really bright-colored foods can be really effective. Um, so that's more follicular. I, a follicular phase and ovulatory phase are the ones where women feel the most – it's kind of this – it's usually the, the phases that society accepts women more in a way. It's when you feel more just energized, like sexy, just really like amazing in your body, um, you know, which can be nice to utilize that rising energy to really start a new creative project or make important decisions for your life. Um, that can be really amazing. Um, yeah. And then the next phase, yeah. Um, next phase we have is the ovulatory phase. And this one is, yeah, peak hormones, your peak testosterone, peak estrogen. So your sex drive is going to be the highest if hormones are balanced, of course, as well. So sex drive is high. Um, and actually, a really cool thing is you're going to appear more like magnetic and attractive. And it's not even a sexual thing. You'll be, be appear more attractive to everyone and you can utilize that energy um, to, you know, for public speaking, uh, even your communication skills are heightened. This is something I really notice for me during ovulation because I do a lot of public speaking and I find that um, just public speaking, first impressions, like talking, all of those can be come just like so naturally and so easy during that time. So it's great to utilize that energy um, for whatever you want to do. It's kind of like that cli the climax point, that high energy point where you're just going to have a lot of energy. You're going to feel a lot more outward. Um, this of course can depend for each woman. You might notice that it can feel different some months, but this is usually the experience, um, that lots of people have. Yeah. And it's like, it's good if you need to give like a talk or, um, if you're planning to give a talk or something like that, or you're not going to be on stage. This is a good time, I think, to also do that because you're just a little bit more, you know, compared to if you were on your period, it wouldn't necessarily, mm -hmm. at least not for me. I, yeah. I just, I'm not, I'm, I'm very inward at that time. Definitely. Yeah. And I find too, in, in the luteal phase for me, so right before my period, sometimes like your blood, well, I find my blood flow, like it almost goes from my brain more into my uterus. So sometimes I have trouble with like word recall and different, it's hard to formulate sentences perfectly. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing I notice. So if I can, I try and kind of do it definitely more follicular ovulatory phase. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely if you need to pull your all nighters, ovulation's the time to do it <laughs> because your energy is higher. You know, not saying that everyone should be doing it, but it's that, you know, if you need to work harder, you know, it's, it's best to work harder at that time because your body can handle it. And you even can metabolize things like coffee and caffeine and chocolate. Your liver is even better at metabolizing those foods. So even though people will crave thing, chocolate more in the luteal phase, which I'll talk about right away, um, it's more better. It's better to like have more of those foods when you can handle them more. So just that natural high energy. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go into the luteal phase. So this one is um, about it's, a, it's around 12 days for most women, 12, actually 12 to 16 days. So it's a, a, it's a longer phase. And it's definitely the progesterone dominant time and progesterone has a pretty profound impact on our bodies. Um, what happens here is it's like, usually you'll, you might notice an increase in creativity because you're potentially for the body might still think potentially it's conceived and there's just this creative energy that's happening. So I know that my experience is during the first phase uh, over the first week of my luteal phase, I feel a lot more creative, but more internally creative. So I'm more into like writing, you know, if some, you like painting, it's like that time to kind of really listen to your intuition and your creativity and just let that 
come out. Um, and then the second half kind of turns into this administrative kind of energy, almost like if you, you know, for anyone that's had a baby, it's like this nesting period where you want to just like do like prepare everything. And, and you can, in the luteal phase, you can use that energy that you have for really administrative tasks like cooking and, you know, doing taxes, spreadsheets, like almost if you want to use your menstrual cycle for projects, you would set your intentions during menstruation and then you would start working on things. And then that luteal phase would be the time to like tie up the loose ends and work on, you know, whatever you need done to complete the project. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is, yeah, I I love being able to do that. And and also another thing too, with PMS symptoms, because there lots of people experience them. Um, what you can do is the PMS symptoms that come up, it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. It really can be the things that you've been suppressing your entire cycle are going to start to bubble up and you're going to notice them because of your hormone levels. So it's a great time to address those things rather than having them be like something that's just going to drag and something you want to suppress. But you can you can realize that those are coming up for a reason and definitely good to address them. And then you can, you know, release them during the menstrual phase. So it's this beautiful cycle, this natural cycle that we have in our body can just be used for so much in our lives. Oh, wow. Yes, it's so true. And it's definitely something that I will. And sometimes, you know, the phases will go by and I'm like, oh, my God, I feel super creative or I just like I can write really well. And I'm like, wait, where am I in my cycle right now? And I have to kind of look back and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, of course, that totally Mm -hmm. makes sense. So just being a little bit more aware of where you are in your cycle, incorporating some different foods, and even some different attitudes. And if it's, you know, a time when your body, um, you know, if you're having cramps, or you're just really bloated and tired, and you have your period, and you don't really want to go to the gym, just give your body a break and just listen to that. Mm Hmm. Yes. Yeah. So important to just be aware of that. And, and it really is all about awareness. I find um, for you, for you, for lots of women, you can track your cycle. So there's lots of different ways to track it. But I, at the very minimum, I recommend that you women always know when their period is and what day it's in. So I usually track in an, in an app called Kindara. But if you are wanting to conceive or you're struggling with some menstrual issues, you can track your basal body temperature and your cervical mucus. And that can give you a lot of clarity. And it doesn't have to be this intense, strict thing unless it's really necessary for you. But I find that just always having that awareness all the time of like knowing where I am in my cycle, it just is, it is a really natural, intuitive thing that I find just so empowering. All right. Now, one last thing I wanted to talk about um, briefly is about birth control pills. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to know about some of the things that it potentially can do to harm a woman. And if women, if a woman wants to get off it, how they could, they could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So birth control pills, I, th- I just see a big problem. The, the biggest problem that I see happening is that they're putting them on young girls and then g- women end up on them for 20 years and they don't let their body have time to balance itself out, especially in puberty. If you're on it when you're 13, like I, I know women that girls that are on it at 13, you know, for so long. Um, and sometimes they're on it for reasons like cramping or PCOS. But the thing is that those suppress like the the birth control pill isn't balancing your hormones which is what a doctor might say it's more so suppressing like it's just making you not ovulate so you don't have these hormonal symptoms so sometimes it is necessary for some women that might be having things like excessive bleeding and different things that are very serious however it is so possible to balance those things with nutrition and food and lifestyle that I think it's so worth it for women to to do it naturally because the, the one of the main problems is if a woman has been on it for her entire life and then she goes off of it and then all of a sudden she might have 
um, symptoms associated with PCOS. And then maybe she's 30 something and she wants to conceive and she has a, a kind of a strict timeline of when she wants to do it, but then it might take some extra years to do that. Um, I think it's just a hard thing. So I think women, you know, should get off of it as soon as they can so they can balance their body out rather than getting on it like right before they want to conceive. Um, so that's one like major important thing that I think is imp- is like women need to know. Um, another thing too, that's quite surprising that I, I, not a lot of people know about this is that going on the pill actually impacts your pheromones that will impact who you're attracted to. And instead of being attracted to someone that might have like opposite pheromones, you'll be attracted to someone that, you know, has other like pheromones that when you go off the pill, you might not have the same attraction to that. So interesting. Yeah. So that's a big thing. Like I know that, yeah, one of my friends, that was one of the main reasons she went off the pill or the IUD because she was just really struggling with, um, feeling attracted to a lot of the guys that she was dating and, you know, and like just with the sex life, it wasn't like she was, it wasn't working for her as much. So going off the pill is such like a a big reason for that because it can impact those. So I think, yeah, women need to know about that and how it also is associated with depression, long-term depression. This was another new study that just came out that um, shows that the, the pill can be related to that. It can also deplete B vitamins and increase candida, which is like a yeast overgrowth in the body. But I just think on our regular, and another thing is that it just has not been studied. It's only been around for like a generation pretty much, or two generations. And we're not seeing the long-term impacts. And when you think about how it does impact your hormones and, and can impact even like sex drive and long-term testosterone levels. So there's so many things that it's just a shame that it's not common. And when that teenager like is on the pill, gets put on the pill, she won't be told about this by their doctor. And now I know so many women, um, when I, I did a poll in my private Facebook group and I'm like, what would, what do you wish that you knew about when you were, um, a teenager about like hormones and they just kind of wish they knew about the effects of both the pill before they were given it. So yeah, that's my, that's my spiel on the pill, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's possible though to balance your hormones when you come off of it as well. I just wanted to quickly add, um, yeah, I'd say one of the biggest thing that I see, I'd say at least 90% of the time, um, when I have women come into my practice, the biggest thing they complain of is low libido, low to, mm-hmm. to zero libido. And, you know, I help women, women's health in general, but sexual health is also under my thing. So, when I have a woman that comes to me with low libido and they've had their whole, I mean, they, they could be on the pill for 20 plus years yeah. and, you know, from the age of 15 for some acne and then they just stay on it because they're in college and they're sexually active and then, okay, well, you know, now I'm sexually active in my twenties. Maybe they'll get off it if they ever want to have a child, but then, but sometimes they're on it through the age of who knows, like in their thirties. So mm-hmm. they've been on it quite some time and, this, this low libido, it's like it's suppressed, those birth control pills have suppressed your hormones to the point where, you know, you can get off the pill and we can get those hormones running again. But, you know, it does take a little bit of time. You've been on these hormones for so, so, so long. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and for anyone that's listening to, I did put together a um, protocol that you can just download for free. Um, I can send you the link to that. Um, but it's about how to de- um it's like a, nu- a nutrition based protocol that I use some smoothies and some other like herbal approaches that, you, that women can use to detox from the pill um, that I find is really like effective too. So you can women can do a lot. And even if they're preparing to go off of it, because I know lots of women with PCOS, like polycystic ovarian syndrome, it can, there can be a lot of anxiety about going off of it because of the excess hair growth and other things that it causes. So you can even start like kind of doing some smoothies and doing some things now before you get off of it. Or if you've been off of it for a while, but the hormones aren't working, you can still utilize a lot of these foods. Yes, totally. Totally. All right. Well, I 
love, I've been just loving this conversation. It's definitely things that I talk about. I'm glad you kind of outlined some of these foods and, you know, different things to watch for during the menstrual cycle. I think this is super key. And Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the pill, it's really the person that's actually controlling your cycle is Pfizer and not the moon where it really should be. So Mm -hmm. um, the moon and the tides, we are no longer in sync with then we are in sync with Pfizer or whatever pharmaceutical company has um, created the birth control that you're taking. So Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, this was, has been so great. Now, any last, last tips that you, that we didn't cover or anything that you wanted to add? Um, I think that, yeah, that's everything. There's so much that I have to share, but that those are the main for adrenal fatigue, fertility, menstrual health. That's what I think is so important for women. So important. Because, you know, like, when your hormones are off, it doesn't just affect your body. Um, it affects all different areas of your life, your relationships, your confidence, your work, your energy, like it kind of can just stop women from living life to the fullest, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that the more we can do to like educate women about it and just make it a priority and kind of make, make it a, a value, like really valuing women's fertility, just in, in all different hormone balances, you know, that's what I think is so key and and so important. Mm, Yes. Thank you for that. Um, Let's see. And so how can people find you? Tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, my website is naturalhormonehealing.com. And yeah, they can find me there. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. I also have an online course coming up called Eating for Your Cycle. So you can always when you connect with me, you can learn more about that. And yeah, I'd love to share too my detox protocol too that anyone can can really get. So you can connect with me if you um, also pick up that protocol. And that link is right on your website. Um, I can send you that link, um, and we can put it, or I, I can repost it somewhere so we can find a good spot for people. Yeah, and I actually I could put it all into the show notes, so you can send oh, that over to me, and yeah. I'll add that to the show notes. No yes. problem. So, okay. what is it? It's detoxing from the pill, and you have yeah, it's a it's a protocol to detox from the pill, and also to balance hormones. It's it's really designed to detox the, the estrogens and and make sure the liver functions well. So a woman could use this for fertility too. Okay, awesome, awesome. Let's see, you're on Instagram, Facebook. Okay, and you got your website. Okay, great. Now, I usually end all of my uh, conversations with three really quick questions. Okay. Um, let's see. What is one of your favorite... Um, do you have a favorite podcast at all? Hmm. What is my favorite podcast right now? Like, I've just been... I really love this podcast because I've been it's called the Priestess Presence podcast right now. That's what I'm listening to. Oh yeah, so I love like Divine Feminine, like every anything to do with that. I'm so <laughs> into. Yeah, I've been diving more into podcasts lately, and yeah, I'm learning more. Lots of good ones. Yes, the Priestess Presence. That's with um, Jules. Hmm. Yes, I had her on my, um, Julie Parker. She was on my podcast, um, several episodes ago. So oh, that's wonderful. There. Yeah. yeah. To talk about the, I love also talking about divine feminine and sacred mm-hmm. feminine and just so good. Yes. Um, okay. Um, name something that you wouldn't mind spending a lot of money on, like some major, like one of your most favorite indulgences. Mm, that I don't mind spending money on mm-hmm. usually anything to do with like natural skincare and essential oils, just like really high quality, like beautiful skincare. That's something where, yeah, I don't mind spending money on that. Mm, and I, I so do. Important. Yeah. I have a lot of a pretty big stock and I do make my own a lot now, but yeah, that's something when I look back in the last like five years, 10 years, I've spent a lot of money on it, but it's so good to have good. I love um, a company called Living Libations and um, those are my, that's my favorite skincare line. Oh, cool. And what is currently at your bedside right now? Hmm. Yeah. My bedside has my journal and 
I'm reading this book on Kundalini Yoga by Guru Jagat called Invincible Living. Um, oh, yeah. That's, and, yeah, and I always have water. I always just always try and have water before in the morning and afterwards. So, yeah, that's by my bedside. And my um, citrine crystal as well. Ah, oh, and to the crystals, me too. Mm-hmm. I love citrine. Awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. I think that kind of wraps it up for this conversation. Thank you so much, Madeline, for coming on the show, for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom about, you know, how women can really embrace, you know, embrace our cycle and really kind of go with the flow, literally, and, you know, take each each phase, um, be really conscious about it with what you're eating and your movement practice and whatnot. So thank you so much for sharing all of this really good stuff. Mm, thank you so much for having me. It's been such an honor to be on your podcast. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you and have a beautiful night. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this episode with Madeline this week and feel a little more empowered when it comes to your cycle and different foods to help enhance fertility, as well as helping out with your adrenals. So for more information on Madeline and all the show notes, head on over to margaromero.com forward slash episode 53. And if you missed my announcement last week, I just want to let you know that I have a new website, which is up and running and I love it and it's beautiful. And you can check that out at margaretromero.com. If you've been loving these episodes, I would so love it if you can head on over to iTunes and leave a five-star review. Much love to you all. Catch you next week. Big hugs. Bye for now.